In our last session, we looked at the relationship between servanthood and holism. As we looked at the way Jesus served, it wasn't just to the spiritual needs of people. He served in every area of human need. And we need to do the same. In this session, what I'd like us to do is to, to look at the relationship between holism, servanthood, and transformation. What's the relationship between those three things? To begin with, I'd like us, if we could, to read from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Very familiar passage if you've been to Bible school or seminary. But I, th I think often really misapplied, misunderstood. And it was only until recent years as I looked at this passage and I began to see that I think God is saying something different here than what I've been taught. But this is what it says. It was he, Jesus, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. What is Paul saying here? Well, I think we need to to parcel it out and try to understand it verse section of each verse by section. First of all, Paul lists five of the gifts that Christ gives to individuals in the church. They're all different. An apostle, somebody who's a pioneer, has a different kind of ministry than the evangelist, who has a different kind of ministry than the pastor, who has a different kind of ministry than the teacher. These are all apostolic, prophetic, evangelistic, pastoral teaching gifts. These are all different. There's no question about that. But I would suggest, because of what Paul says later, that he is telling us they have a different starting point, but they have exactly the same ending point. What is that ending point? Well, we see it here in verse 12. Paul says that the ending point is to prepare God's people for works of service. What? I think if the evangelist does his job and he wins people to Christ, He's done his job. Paul says, no. That's not enough. You win people to Christ so that they can be equipped to serve. Your Bible study teacher? It's not good enough just to teach people what's in the Word of God. In my living room a few days ago, we had one of our staff and he was telling me about how he was having Bible studies with the Nepalese refugees here in our city. And I asked him, well, what do you do beyond Bible study? He said, well, you know, not much. I said, do you think that Bible study is discipling these new believing Nepalese refugees here? And he said, yeah. I said, I don't. Just because you know the Bible doesn't mean you're going to do what the Bible says to do. And what does the Bible say to do? It says to serve. And just because you study the Bible, I know from my many years of having grown up in an evangelical church that Bible study does not lead to people being servants. 
automatically at all. Yes, it happens occasionally. Bible study is not discipleship. It's part of it, a necessary part of it, but it is not discipleship. So if you're a Bible study, study teacher, if you're a pastor and you're not equipping your people in your church to serve, you haven't finished your job. If you're an apostolic ministry and you're out planting churches or you're a missionary somewhere and those churches that you plant are not equipping the people in that body to serve the person with the apostolic gift has not completed his job. Yes, these are each different gifts. They have a different starting point, but they have the same ending point. What is that ending point? It's the purpose of why we become born again. Why are we made whole? So that we can reflect the attitude that was in Jesus Christ. And what is that attitude? It's the attitude of a servant. If what we do in our churches does not end up equipping God's people to serve, we have not done our job. Let's look at verses 12 through 13. And this is so important to see the flow and the connection between these verses. First of all, you have a list of five of the gifts that God gives to leaders in the church. Then you have a description of what their single purpose is, and that is to equip God's people to serve. And thirdly, Paul tells us what happens when we do that. This is what has not happened in Europe and in North America in the last century, increasingly so in this century. We bring people to Christ. They come into church. We plant many churches. We have Bible studies and all kinds of classes. Very cognitive, focused, and oriented. But we're not doing the main thing that is the task of the church. And that is equipping those people to sublimate what is best for them to what is best for others. Look what Paul says in verse 13. He says, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attending to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. I'd like you to look at this slide. This is what verse 13 says. It says, when we produce servants, three things happen in the church. The first is, is that the church of Jesus Christ, not just in our own local church, but as the church is the body of Christ worldwide, becomes servants. The church becomes unified. <laughs> Would we like to see unity in the body of Christ? Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that is the greatest detractor for people who are non-Christians is the disunity of the church. And the fighting of one denomination or one church against another. And the jealousy and the competition. How does that disappear? Paul says here that the way it disappears is that we equip our people to serve. And obviously that they we get them in a position of serving. That's a consequence of being obedient to the holistic gospel. Secondly, Paul says, we become, or they become, the people in the church, in our churches, they become mature. Isn't that the dream of every pastor? That the people of his congregation become mature? And they're able to be people of God 
who reflect the image of Jesus Christ, the chief servant? Of course, that's the, our desire. And we, we try it through group studies and potlucks and small groups. But we don't end up with a congregation full of mature people. What we end up with often is a congregation full of spiritual babies. How do we grow mature? How do we disciple people to become mature? The primary way, according to Paul right here, is that we equip them to serve. And we then, of course, by implication, get them to serve. And then the third thing that Paul says is that when we serve, we reflect the fullness of Christ. What is that fullness of Christ? In Ephesians 3, just the chapter before, 17 through 19, Paul gives probably one of the most beautiful expositions of what the fullness of Christ means. What does it mean? It means that when people look at us, they see love that is so high, so deep, so wide, that the world can't comprehend it. The world doesn't understand why we sublimate what we feel is best for ourselves for the, what is good for somebody else. They can't understand that because that doesn't happen without the power of the Holy Spirit, without the power of the Jesus Christ who lives within us. That's what it means to reflect the fullness of Christ. In one word, the fullness of Christ is love, as we just saw in Ephesians 3, 17 and 19, through 19. It's a love that is so high, so deep, so wide, that it's incomprehensible. It's incomprehensible because it's not human. It's divine. How can the finite comprehend the infinite? We can't do that. But it can be possible that we can possess that infinite kind of love if we serve, if we sublimate what is our desire for what is best for somebody around us. And that servanthood is reflected in all domains. It's not just serving others in terms of evangelism. It's not serving others just in terms of planting churches or holding small groups or doing Bible studies. All of those things are good if they end up in that one single purpose that Paul tells us is the purpose of the gifts. And that is to equip God's people for service. In history, we see examples of how that kind of love has an impact on transformation. And I want to look at that in, the last, in our last session together. But before we do that, I'd like you to just take some personal time and ask the question, Father, do I see in my own life that kind of service? And if not, we need to commit to asking God to develop the same attitude in us that was in Jesus Christ.